All right. Just give it a couple more minutes. We're waiting. Just a couple, just maybe a minute. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Hope you all can sit back and relax and enjoy a little bit of jazz and ease into the weekend. Ease into the weekend. <laughs> Well, that shut down. Maybe that was that was an automatic telling us. Yeah. <laughs> Coltrane. Oh, but let's John Coltrane wrapped it up. But isn't this a great? Does this not put you in the for some of the young Just whippers? Relax, you guys don't it. know about Bill Cosby. <laughs> Yeah, it's all-time favorites. Yes. I mean, I just, when I, and I know this, I mean, this music has been out for a while, but I always pictured the Huxtables back in the day. This <laughs> Huxtable, uh, Claire, and, and was it Bill? I don't know, it was Heathcliff, Heathcliff, Heathcliff. Always pictured them dancing. Good memories of this. <laughs> we ready, Serene? Yes, we are. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, welcome. We welcome everybody. Thank you all for joining us today um, and taking time out of your day. It's the weekend. It's Friday. Yay. So happy Friday to everybody. Um, and for those of uh, for those of you that have joined us and been following us over the past couple months, we thank you for your support. Um, always, we could not do this. It would not be successful without you. And to, to those of you that are new and maybe first timers, we appreciate you joining us. This is a piece and we'll tell you a little bit about us and just our monthly um, lecture series, a chat, if you will. The the flow is very informal, very relaxed. We are about informing and my dog is in the back. So welcome to pandemic and being home virtual. You might hear him in the back making noise, but we are here to celebrate us. Um, back in the day it was a company called FUBU, For Us, By Us. And if, you know, that's sort of what this is to celebrate. We, uh, we honor and acknowledge everybody, but we enjoy coming together to acknowledge our own men and women, boys and girls and celebrate um, us and how awesome we are. So. PEACE, it stands for uh, Pennsylvania Education, Empowerment and Achievement Center. It is a, a nonprofit 501c3 status, youth empowerment organization. Our tagline is Dare to Educate, Inspire and Dream, where we really in, um, work to ex get students excited about education in grades K through college, get them excited about education, equip them with the tools um, to be great and be inspired and empower others and then dare them to dream. Um, so again, we work with partners um, and other experts in the community. We were not the experts. My name is Alexis Musgrove, I should have said that first. My background is in education. My partner who uh, you'll hear from shortly, Serene High, her background is in healthcare. Um, so those are the two, if you will, pillars of the organization. But our goal is really to equip students to be prepared for success academics K through college, but college is not for everybody. So even just post-secondary success. And we focus on those issues around the quality, um, focus on areas around the quality of life issues. So, you know, health, employment, education, economics, power, finance, um, self-respect, community, leadership, et cetera. And that's really just both of our passions. Um, so um, I won't say a whole lot. That is who we are. We're just here to serve, sent to serve, help our students be fantastic and great, believe in themselves. And today um, we're gonna talk about a specific topic as we do each month and I'll turn it over to Serene. Good afternoon and uh, happy Friday to everyone. Thank you all so very much as always for joining us today. Uh, today we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the art of creating and um, really about art exploration. And it's, it's not only fun and entertaining, but also educational. Uh, we'd like to explore the impact of art and, and what it does to you know, individuals, specifically from an, more of an adolescent area, an adolescent age. Uh, children are naturally curious. And from the minute they gain control of their limbs and uh, they work to put themselves out into the world. They see how things work by touching and feeling. They explore, they observe, they imitate, and they try to figure out things, how to operate things and how to control themselves in their environment. And this sort of, uh, I would say, unrestricted exploration allows children to form 
connections in their brain and it essentially helps them learn. And so our focus this month on art, arts and the exploration of the various careers and arts and the impact it has you know, on us and the freedom that it has that allows us to manipulate different types of feelings and emotions, just being organic. You'll hear a lot about what, what that focus is for this month. And so today we have with us uh, actually three dynamic individuals. Uh, today we celebrate uh, two specifically who are on our panel, and then we'll hear from uh, a, a person who, a young high school student who will share with us um, uh, a little bit of spoken word. And so we'll now, today we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna celebrate uh, Maureen Hennigan Booker, and then there will be Miss Deja Murray. So we'll get a little bit into that later, the introductions later, but we will now have a poem by Ms. Dominique Bethel, as she is an 11th grader at North Penn High School. Uh, she will present to us an original piece entitled, Where is the Justice? So I'm gonna turn the mic over to Dominique. Hi guys. Okay, I'm gonna just stand up. Okay, it's, it will work if you guys wanna close your eyes or if you just, just better help you feel the poem, I guess. As I watch my fellow brother on the ground pleading, as I watch my fellow brother on the ground pleading for breath, falling on deaf ears, a knee is the cause of his death, a knee. Outside looking in, I see the world mourns as his child weeps. I hear the cry for justice and equality for that which they seek. Where is the justice? My words muffled by riots and where peace and love lie, I will always stand by it. Trying to figure out why without reason. Trying to figure out why the wound of slavery still bleeding. Where is the justice? I can't breathe, he said. Put your hands up, don't shoot. Bang, he was misled. See, if he was a different color, he would get a slap on the wrist and go ahead but instead lying cold on his deathbed. Yeah, he was pulled over because of his blackness. Yeah, he was pointed at gunpoint because of his blackness. Yeah, he was shot dead because of his blackness. Now his weeping mother has to go find him a medium-sized casket. Where is the justice? Say their name. Starting all the way to preteens, ain't that insane? You know the saying, time waits for no man? I guess that was true for the man holding a gun in his hand. Where is the justice? It gets hard seeing mothers distraught faces and it gets worse when I hear the not guilty cases. Breonna Taylor. We all saw or heard how the bullets unjustly impaled her. I just hope one day we find justice for those who died. Until then, I hope my people protest with a powerful stride. Where is the justice? Thank you. You can't hear me saying woo on the other side of that mute. Sheesh. And look, our audience, as you know, we have just the speakers and our panelists um, on video, so you all see us. But let me just say, I guarantee, and guys, you can put it, I believe, Senator, you have the chat enabled. I know folks are blowing up. You see hand claps. Dominique, awesome. Awesome. I got chills, girl. It was fantastic and just Thank so you. brilliant. Um, like Serene said, an original piece. You are totally gifted, talented. And girl, you move the room. It, look, where there is no room, you make room. Welcome to the room. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. We we'll see a lot of comments in the um, chat. Awesome, great. Sorry, can't clap. Yay, Dominique. Awesome. We, we thank you for that. It was amazing. Thank you. Amazing. so Amazing. So, got it. Got to give that to you, girls. That that deserves just a moment of whoo. Yeah. Rest on that. That's yeah. awesome. 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 Yes. So, thank you, Dominique Bethel. Appreciate that again. She's an 11th grader at North Penn High School, and that was her 
uh, poem that she wrote, Where is the Justice? So I, I, we, I know folks will be seeking you out. I already got plans. I'm like, that, that's great, that's great. So let's kick it off, guys. We That was one of our phenomenal women today. Um, we are now gonna introduce you to two other extraordinary women. Um, and I'll, I'll do that now. First, we have Miss Maureen Hennigan Booker. Uh, she is an actor, dancer, and choreographer. And I'm reading the bio because, you know, we have to give us our flowers while we're here. And I don't want to miss anything. And let me just say this. We did have to truncate it because she does everything, everything and everything well. But you'll get to meet as you hear from her. And also with uh, Dej, they do a number of things. But we want to give you the meet and then you get to talk to them and hear from them and you'll be able to tell how fantastic they are. So Maureen Hennigan Booker is an actor, dancer, and choreographer, uh, director, and certified. And Maureen, you'll shake your head. Is it pronounced Veganova? Veganova? Vaganova. Vaganova, look at that. Vaganova instructor, Russian ballet. She began a professional classical dance training at the Peabody Conservatory of Music, studied at the Dance Theater of Harlem, and was a merit scholar at the Alvin Ailey, the Alvin Ailey Dance Company, uh, American Dance Center. Her professional dance career began with the Philadelphia Dance Company, those in Philadelphia we know AKA as Philodenko, where she performed for many years mastering her craft. Maureen has performed both nationally and internationally in music, theater, drama, concert, and dance. Some of her stage credits include Black Nativity, Pearly, Chicago, and Porgy and Bess. She is a professional actress and a member of the Actors' Equity Association. Finally, Maureen attended Hampton University in Virginia, HU, where she studied speech communication and theater arts. She later graduated from Gaucher, or is it Gaucher? Goucher College. Goucher, I messed it up today, but thank you. Goucher College in Maryland with a bachelor's degree of arts in degree, a bachelor of arts degree in dance performance and choreography and English. Welcome Maureen. And now we'll introduce Charnay. Uh, Deja, Charnay's her mom. <laughs> I keep calling her. <laughs> She looks as beautiful as am I, and I, let me tell you, it's like I call Kasai Serena, Serena Kasai. So Deja is joining us. Her mother is Karsha, um, da, da, Charnay. So Deja, um, Serena will introduce you now. Thank you. Art is her voice. Deja, welcome Deja. Deja is an art student, three-time marathon finisher, and the founder of an online shop where she turned her work into wearable art as she is so graciously wearing one of her pieces. And if you can take a look at that now. We're just gonna flash it a little bit, give <laughs> myself some self-promotion. <laughs> that's self-promotion and that shirt is called Imani. Well, this allows her art to be enjoyed and seen by many who may have never been exposed to beautifully tragic art. Although, Jay, although Deja aspires to work in animation, her true passion lies in storytelling through the visuals she creates. This love drives her to pursue this art form as a, cre as her, as a career. Deja aims to create characters and worlds while also depicting black lives and culture. In turn, striving to inspire a new generation of young artists like her. Deja currently studies at SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design as an animation major with a concentration in storytelling and production. Welcome, Deja. Thank you. Thank you for introducing me. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So ladies, um, we're gonna get started. And again, to the audience, we share, and if you know P. Serena and I well, and even if you don't, um, you know, we talk about our event, like you said, it's for us, by us. It is not um, a shishi fufu. We are all classy ladies of all you know, uh, everything, but this is really laid back. It's informal. It is really about connecting and hoping that we are providing enriching information. Um, again, peace, we serve, you know, kindergarten through college, but in that our supporters and many of you that have joined us today over the, over the years are of all ages, you know, even ethnicities, but today with us, there are women of all ages. So our questions we're gonna tailor to kind of make sure we're providing, um, you know, welcome information, but for everybody. So hopefully you're listening up and where you can grab a nugget, hold on to it and, and take it with you. So with that panelist, we wanna hear uh, about your path, where you are now, the successes, your journeys, the ups and downs, candid conversation, and we're gonna get started. To both of you, and we'll start with Deja, share with us just how you were as a student. So high school, Marina, it could be with college. How are you like academically, socially, um, careers, goals, and dreams? Just give us an idea. We'll ask you about two minutes if you could. Tell us how you were as a young person. Um, and then we'll, we'll go from there. We'll start with you, Deja. 
Okay. Um, so I'll pretty much just kind of start where a lot of my like drive pretty much started. So back in high school, um, art was mainly a hobby of mine. I didn't really think much of it, um, especially during freshman and sophomore year. It was kind of just something I would do to get by through the day and it would be a bit of a distressor, um, especially going to Central, which is a pretty um, intense school to go to in Philadelphia. Um, it would be nice to have time to just sit down and like unwind and sketch for a bit. But I think it wasn't until I got into junior and senior year that I started to kind of piece together that there was a bit behind my art than I was kind of expecting um, initially. So um, I managed to explore that within senior year for AP art. I had my concentration around my whole project for that year um, around black hair, because I figured it was something I'm very familiar with, something my mom grew up being familiar with. And exploring that through art um, was just a way to kind of seep into that aspect of my life a bit more. And I think as I was going about making each painting, making each drawing, um, I found this hidden passion for storytelling and representation through the work that I created and seeing how that touched a lot of people who saw it and shared it around and even bought some of my work after I was, um, after I graduated high school. So from there, I decided, you know what, why not kind of continue doing this thing full time and go to college for it. So I went to SCAD, I applied for SCAD, got accepted and went, and I'm currently a junior now and I'm getting ready to start approaching my senior year, which is crazy thinking about it, but um, I'm still, creating all these different stories, all these different facets of life and still touching upon my own. Um, and as you can see, inspired my apparel work as well. So it's just, it's a deeper connection than I once thought it was. And I'm glad I was able to get that chance to explore early on before tapping into that a lot later in life. Yeah. Maureen, yeah, would you share with us how you were as a student, the high school, college, you know, academically, socially, how were you and, and career and goals? Is this what you dreamed or thought you would do and be? Um, I, guess, I guess the first thing I would like to say is hello to everyone. And um, I would first like to acknowledge the our actor, uh, Dominique Bethel, your piece was wonderful. Um, can you all hear me? I can't hear you all at all. Oh yeah, I muted myself. You. Yeah, we can hear, we can hear you. Hear, Thank you. Know, as you speak, we'll mute just so we don't you don't hear our background, but we can hear you well. Okay. Thank you. Um, I would say I was always dancing. We even have some real to real of my dancing, just dancing. Um, as a student, I was a little bit different. I was always on a very fast track academically. Froze for a moment. Uh, Maureen, are you there? Maureen, we lost your volume. Yeah. Um, there she is. Can Can you all hear me? Yes. Yep. It froze. Yes. For you a froze. Yeah. We We just heard. Yeah. At the beginning. Okay. Um, I I was always dancing, and I was captured at a very young age just to do an old fashioned dance group, old fashioned dance group with leotard and tights. And it just so happened that was in sixth grade, just so happened I stepped up to be the choreographer. And all I knew was what I saw Debbie Allen and George Faison do on The Tonight Show. So I began to just mimic that and then I was captured to go to the Arena Players in Baltimore, Maryland, Arena Players Regional Theater. And that's when I kind of began shaping this track in what we call conservatory training. And when I say conservatory training, I know Deja, Deja would um, definitely understand what I mean. It means learning your technical approaches, learning about the Horton technique, learning about Vaganova, Chiketti, Bourninville, learning about um, Graham technique, being trained 
in the academy techniques so that you're ready for the rigor. But as a student, I would, I would consider myself advanced and precocious. I was, I had a late birthday plus I skipped. So I was always on the fast track academically. And then we always had the acting group, the dance group right there in public school. We didn't have to go to these other places. So after school, that's when I went down in Baltimore to the summer and after school to arena players. And that's when we began to learn our scripted work, our work by August Wilson, our work by Tennessee Williams, all of those classic works, learning how to take scripts, learning how to listen to directors, learning how to listen to the piano, play you in four counts, all of that, it was coming together. So the academics wasn't separate from our life in the arts. It was one thing. It was one thing. Do you, you all remember after school, you would just go down to the dance group? Does anybody remember that? And yeah. you really, you really didn't think that it was separate. It was all in there together. But to answer your question, rigor, rigor was my academics. I can keep talking. Three. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I was still, okay. So what advice would you give your younger self? Deja, we'll start with you, followed by Marie. Okay. Um, very interesting question. I'm still very young. Um, you I are haven't your younger turned, self. I'm very my, my younger self already. I'm only 20. So there's still a lot I have to learn. Um, I understand that much. And even now I'm still learning, um, both in academics as well as in life. I think one thing I would tell my younger self is to um, not pressure yourself to be perfect, um, especially being in high school, um, striving to just improve based on your own goals, as opposed to what everything surrounding you is telling you to do. I think that's the one thing I wish I just gave myself time to simmer on was just not pressuring myself to be the best artist ever, just to be my best self each and every day as I pass. Just being able to just be myself and live life um, and enjoy it while it lasts because nothing's promised. So to just be in the moment and to do your best and do the best that you can is just something I would advise even <laughs> my little high school still. So yeah. That's great, thank you. Maureen? Um, could you repeat the question, please? Uh, the question is, what advice would you give your younger self? Um, first, I wanna thank you all for having me here. And Deja, you are such a beautiful young artist. I'm glad to sit on the panel with you. Um, oh my goodness, my younger self, I, I have to tell y'all, my childhood was the <laughs> bomb. I mean, I grew up in Baltimore. I grew up when black people like they are now was just bad. We were bad. Public school, everything was fabulous. And even when I had to move down south, my granddaddy worked me hard and he poured into me such, oh my gosh, he just made me just a, a soldier. What I would say to my younger self is keep on going, keep on trucking, just be bad as you want to be. I'm a, I'm a, what I would say to my younger self is what I did say. <laughs> just keep being bad. Just keep being super duper fly. That's what I would tell Deja. That's what I would tell Dominique. That's what I would tell all of us. Just keep being fly as you want to be. Yes. Okay. Great. 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 That's right. Just keep That's right. Bad. Okay, Marie. 
while we're <laughs> while I while we have the mic on you, just give us a little bit about us about you. Tell us a little bit about you. What's your current position, and how did you arrive at that position? Okay, um, I am the creative and artistic director of Ballet and Beyond Productions. I am a choreographer and a director, but I also um, and, I, and I know exactly what Deja is talking about. She's an artist, but she's also a designer because she, she created her own um, beautiful designs. I also do costume design because I want something specific when I create. I, um, I began Ballet and Beyond because there is an assault on the arts in public school. There was an all-out assault on giving our children the highest level of training in public school. So it kind of was taken out. Most of our very, very famous, I'm going to just say Felicia Rashad, Debbie Allen, George Faison, uh, Alvin Ailey, just everybody, we came to the arts through the public school system. So what happened is um, I did a lot of plays, I choreographed as well as directed. And I was directing a play over at the Walt Whitman's Art Center and Dr. Cassandra Cream of the Park Side School in Camden came to me after the play and said, is there any way you can come to my school and work with my kids? I said, um, I'm not interested in teaching in public school. She said, was there any way we can just give you a contract? I said, okay, okay, I'll put something together. So what I did is I created an arts curriculum, of course, based on the Vaganova technique, as well as uh, some people know Stanislavski method of acting, basic method acting. So I had drama and ballet. And um, what I did is I had to get my business privilege license. I had to pay taxes, you know, get my accountant and I created this arts curriculum. So now I would negotiate my contract with the school district wherever I go. They pay me and I go in as what's called a guest artist. And I teach these kids so that they can be trained. And what I did is I brokered a deal with some of um, the people I know, like uh, I, I used to take class and study at um, Pennsylvania Ballet under John Sherman. So I was able to get a contract to give them tights, leotards and all of that. But what I do is, um, Ballet and Beyond is my company. People pay me commissioned works or I create my own works so that when people hire me, I negotiate a number and the number has to be what I want it to be. Now, I belong to Actors' Equity Union and I've been union rep for a lot of productions. So I get paid well for what I do. Or believe it or not, if I don't get paid well, I don't do it. There you go. There and that goes with teaching, lecturing, and performing, choreo choreography, directing. It does not matter. My intellectual property must be remunerated. There you go, Maureen. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yes. And, and I would like to add, when we get off the phone, I'm going to talk to Dominique. She has to register her poem with the Copyright Office, um, the Library of Congress. Yep. Register your title, your poem, and you will be protected. Thank you so much for that wealth of knowledge. Thank you, Maureen. That's great. Great, great, great. Thank you. So Deja, what made you choose your major and why SCAD? Very interesting question. So I think 
For the longest time, um, I've been really into animation. Like that's just something that I grew up with and just being able to see so many different ways that you can express stories within animation has always enticed me. I think as a child, it was just purely entertainment. Like I thought, oh, these moving pictures and drawings could like do all this different stuff. That's really cool to me. But I think as I started to grow into my art and grow my identity through my art, and evaluate the media that I consumed that influenced my style and the things that I wanted to tap into artistically. Um, I started to see that there was another facet to animation that piqued my interest that is now the core of what I do in my art, which was storytelling. Um, I think no matter what um, show, movie, um, any form of animation, it be a short film or something, like it just has an element to where the things they do within animation cannot be replicated via live action. And I think one movie in particular that kind of made me see that was Prince of Egypt. Obviously the story itself is as grand as it can be. It's from the book of Exodus, but the way they made that story become its own thing through such beautiful visuals and amazing music and um, the way they carried that story, even taking liberties of their own, um, and the passion behind that production, it kind of inspired me in a way to pursue that myself and to kind of dip into that world of creating those stories that can impact and influence um, so many younger people who want to get into that as well. Um, it's a very beautiful thing. And I think it's just something, it's a medium that I don't think gets enough appreciation outside of it being like, oh, it's a Disney thing or it's for children. There's so many things you can do with that. Um, that isn't just meant to be one thing. I think one particular um, animator, Brad Bird said it best that animation isn't um, a genre. It isn't just a little category you put in the Oscar nominations just to have it as an aside. It's its own art form and it can be expressed in so many different ways and it's a very beautiful thing. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deja. You all are giving us good vibes. And I'm yeah. telling you, at the, <laughs> in a few minutes, like sort of toward the end, we're going to sort of read some of the some of the vibes from the from the chat. It's, am it's amazing. So we'll, we'll share that with you if you all haven't read it yet. But I'm yeah, going to turn it yes. over to Alexis. Yes. So, so let me ask you, we're going to go back and forth and, you know, talk a little bit. Remember, we're going to keep it real conversation, right? So as awesome and fabulous as you women are, and you're telling us your journey. We know in every journey, you know, there's ups and downs, there's adversities you face, et cetera. And we want to hear about, you know, give us some advice. Talk to us. We want to hear from you um, how you push through with, with, you know, any adversity. So Deja, I'll start with you. How did you transition, um, pardon me, as a black student from high school to college? And were there any challenges you faced or currently face? And if so, how do you push through? Um, that's actually a very interesting question. I think for the most part, one drastic change I noticed as soon as I got to SCAD, um, that's kind of the reality I think for a lot of children of color who go from high school into college. It's just um, how kind of out of place you feel um, given your identity. I stepped into SCAD thinking like, okay, there might be a diverse group of people here. And while there are plenty of Black students here, um, it's kind of hard to find Black animation students especially. And so when I first started taking my classes, um, I would notice that I wasn't, I was the only Black individual in the class, not even just a Black, only Black girl, but Black person in general. Every now and then I will find someone who's also Black and a creative, and that's always great to see and to see that variety. Um, but it would be very few and far in between. And um, I think just it wasn't a struggle to um, kind of stand out because I think over the years I was able to kind of make my own um, and be noticeable, even though um, I was different from most people within my classes. But it kind of opened, some, opened my eyes a bit to um, the lack of diversity as I was going into wanting to do animation. Um, I think as I was attending these classes, I realized like there's not really a whole lot of black animators either. And they end up being pushed to the background, even though they do exist and they are very much present within the industry. And so I think coming to terms with that was hard initially, but at the same time, as I mentioned before, I still managed to make my mark within these classes and show that 
I was just as capable of being here as anyone else who came here without a scholarship or anyone who came in here not having to face that um, adversity um, growing up. And I think like it was powerful to experience that and to show that I'm more than capable of being within these groups and being a creative. And that didn't stifle um, the creative flow that I had. And um, I think it's, I'm glad that I was able to power through that and not let that affect me. I think as I get older, and start preparing to enter the animation industry, I'm sure things will be a lot different um, since it's more competitive. Um, there's a lot less open to um, some individuals than it would be for white um, animation majors and whatnot. So it's definitely something I have to keep my eyes on, but I do know that I have the chops to make it in the industry. I'm not talentless. I have more than enough capabilities to get there. So, you know. I'm not, I'm not brought down. I'm happy that I'm who I am and I won't let that take me and hinder that journey of mine. So, yeah. That is awesome. I love that statement. I have the chops to handle this. Yeah. I love that. So it's so important <laughs> just being your own cheerleader and it's key. You, you have to. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, love it. Great answer. Great answer. Thank, Thank you for you. sharing with us. Maureen, how about you again, share with us, you know, just challenges you face as a black woman um, in theater and dancing in the arts. And, you know, we all think of a story. I remember hearing about Misty Copeland and her talking about a couple of years ago, her documentary she did and just giving behind the scenes and, you know, all the struggles she went through. So I know you've experienced that, you know, being involved in so many different facets of the industry of arts. Tell us, you know, what did you face, if anything, as a black woman? challenges, adversities, maybe even presently, if not back then? And then how do you push through? And I know you fabulously, you rock it, but you both are, but how do you, you know, how, what, what pushes you? How do you keep going in the face of adversity? You know, I find that, um, I find that your question is provocative. And I say that because you got to be a beast out here. You hear what I'm saying? You can be as cute as you want to be. You can pull it up and keep it tight. But at the end of the day, you got to be a beast. And let me tell you why. Um, I, like I told you, uh, I, I got my acting, serious acting chops, if you will, at Freedom Theater. I had the most phenomenal teachers some of the directors I still work with to this day. So where I come from, you you just bad as you want to be. You know what I'm saying? And if you're not going to be bad, you go home. You just go home. If they're not going to treat you right, oh, I know how to go home. And it's all right. So I always knew the, rule, the union rules. I always knew what we were going to get paid, what you could negotiate how you could handle yourself in that negotiating table. So I got this gig in Europe, Porgy and Bess. It was a United States company out of New York. We went up, we hired, it was a fabulous tour. We were in Austria on the fabulous Lake Constance where the yachts and the cruise ships were coming for the summer. So we were packing the house out. And this was huge. This place had like a thousand, thousands, thousands of seats. So we packed it out. So they decided they were going to add about 20 shows. So I come on in, in the um, dressing room. I said, well, when are we going to talk about the money? Everybody said, well, Miss Maureen, what you talking about? I said, baby, they done added 20 days to the box office. They got to add some money to my bag. They was like, well, Miss Maureen, we're not in America. And, and I know you know the union rules. I said, let me, let me explain something to you. Where we are is a union. So I got on the phone with my sister-in-law, found out what I needed to do. And I just took a meeting with the chancellor of the opera house. I said, no ticky, no laundry. If you add 20 shows, you have to add some money to our bag. And all my dance captain said, I know you're going to go. I'm just asking, can I go with you? 
Yes. And we negotiated. I said, listen, you can't add shows without remunerating the entire cast. Now, the Viennese Orchestra was getting re remunerated. And this is what Dominique's talking about. Where is the justice? The people playing the music, the orchestra from Vienna, they had already been taken care of. But the creatives, the black people up on the stage, they were trying to get past us. And what I'm saying, and I will say this as I admonish um, Deja to make sure she gets a trademark for her Imani and her swag. Make sure you get your trademark. Don't ever be so cute and so creative minded that you don't take care of your business. And regardless of what anyone tells you, your business is to advance your quest economically. That is your business as an artist. Your intellectual property must be advanced economically. Now, my second example, I got to tell you, lady, because it's so long. The story is so long. Okay. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. All right. And can I add something? Go ahead. Yes. You take so long to hone your craft and to be excellent in your technique and to keep your mind inspired and to keep your spirit open to God moving so that you can make yourself available to this creator. No one should ever pay you less than what you demand. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Maureen. I feel you. We're getting some there. Everybody's saying in the chat line, we're getting some Jennifer, Jennifer Williams vibes. No, Jennifer Adam Jennifer, Lewis. Jennifer Lewis, I'm sorry. Jennifer, no worries, no worries. Vibes. I've met her. I've met her. She's fabulous. She's <laughs> Honey, she, boom. She probably thought you were her. And had to kick herself. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at the chat. It's like 27 messages. They're like, you are fabulous. They're, they're loving your vibes. So great, great. Oh, bless your heart. You know, it's rough out here in this pandemic. Woo! <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, goodness. So, Maureen. Is it challenging to get a job in your discipline? And uh, what opportunities are available in the field? And what, sh what would you share with students who want to pursue in the arts? Now, that was a three-part question. So let me know, <laughs> you know what you say. I know, I know. We Give me one about question. I'm a father. Exactly. I, like, I like them one at a time. All right, all right. So <laughs> is it challenging to get a job in your discipline? I have to I have to be honest with you. Um get a job. That language, okay, get a job. Okay, get a gig. Okay. When so just you, talk about because you know that the, the, the word job, you know, you struggle with that word job. So let's No, I don't that. struggle with it. I Take reject it. it. You I reject it. Reject it. Yeah. So let's I talk reject about that it. word job. We don't want to get a job. We want to be our business and we want to advance opportunity. Now that's a paradigm shift because you know we have a history. We come from a history of you get a job, but it's a new day. And since I'm on the phone with, since I'm on the line with the beautiful princess Deja, I will knight her and let her know that she ain't getting no job. She going to have a business and she going to be the standard. There you go. Okay. So where I am at 50 and where I, where I started and then at 30, I had a paradigm shift. And I said, wait a minute, I'm educated. 
I can invest my money into my business privilege license. I can go in and negotiate. I can get my certification. I can do this and that and the third. So now what I do is I say, would you like to be in partnership with me? Or would you like to contract my services? so that I can make the situation better or make the project better. I create my own projects. Now, to answer your question directly, this entire pandemic, I have been on meetings with Actors' Equity Association, which is historically racist, which is historically the great white way. Everybody know about Broadway, right? The great white way. They have always protected more employment from the actors, dancers, stage hands, the producers, everybody. They have protected the majority of the money for white people. Because of what happened to George Floyd, we are now in all of these meetings, if you will, to now repair black performers. And my personal quest, let me explain to you what they did. Mostly white women and white men are Broadway choreographers. You only get a couple of black shows every now and again, and the productive, the executive productive staff brings in their own choreographers, directors, musical directors, costume, kind of like what they did for um, Black Panther. You see how you see how Kugla went straight down the line and had those fabulous, fabulous, fabulous Ruth, Ruth Carter from Hampton University, Chadwick, Chadwick Boseman from Howard University. You see all those beautiful black people? Are you there, Serene? We're here. We can hear we you. Got you. Yeah. You see the cast? I, 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 I need some feedback. Y'all got, got to talk you, to me. <laughs> so you see that casting crew? Mm -hmm. That casting crew is who Brian Kugler wants to do the work. But he also is like, I want the best people, but these are the people I want to get paid. These are the people. I want my people to get paid. Right. Now, y'all, y'all recently saw Ma Rainey, right? Mm -hmm. You yes. got Denzel Washington, who has invested in the entire theatrical canon of August Wilson. He's going to do all ten of his plays. He started with Fences. Now he's doing Ma Rainey. So you got him paying the bill. Then he goes and he gets George C. Wolf. Then he gets Ruben Santiago to write the screenplay. Then he gets all these black actors. Then he get this person to everybody. That's to advance our quest as a people. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in broad, Broadway is here. Then you have regional theater here. Then you have all these special, what they call special, special SPT theaters, special theater contract. And all this correlates to money. Well, what they did is, Instead of giving black women the opportunity to choreograph, they would now give homosexual men the job. So you still have all white people at the executive level of creating. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We doing once on this island about black people from the French Antilles? And you got Jimmy from Nebraska choreographing. Right. We got a problem. We got to take a meeting. Mm -hmm. We got to take a meeting. That's right. That's right. Got because it. it's not enough jobs for you to have your job and you to have our job. Mm -hmm. So right now, to answer your question, we are in negotiation with the Actors Equity Union, which is the union that I pay into for eight. For 28 years, I've been in that union. Mm. So you got to get me to work. You got, that's what the union is supposed to get you to work. And when you join your union, 
Your dream union is supposed to get you to leave to get you to go seize. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you can get your hand in that bag. And when you get your hand in that bag, you're able to replicate for a baby danger, for another sister coming out of scan, another sister coming out of all these places. Mm -hmm. We have to replicate our own. Right. Now, now that's me because I went to Hampton Institute and when I got there, the baddest people ever was waiting for me. Mm -hmm. So I had to get on board and I got it. Everybody replicates so they can build, build this black aesthetic, build this African aesthetic. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the Oscars and you look at all of this, it's not just four and five of us. Right. Just like Adam Magruder, Adam Magruder blew the spot up with Boondocks. He blew it up mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's coming back. Yep. Love, Maureen, you, let me tell you, awesome, awesome, awesome advice. It really is just powerful. So on point, so on it. And, and we're going to switch it up a little bit because uh, Deja, as you know, I, I was going to share with you and kind of ask you what were some of the, you know, is there, do you see um, progress or in your, in your industry, are there opportunities? You guys are, I mean, we chose you because you're in the arts and the same. So I'm, I'm going to ask mm -hmm. you, you can kind of throw it out a little bit, you know, are there opportunities in your field? Can you get employment? I'm thinking of students from high school to college, even younger students that may be on the line. You know, are there opportunities? I love it. We're not going to say a J-O-B because it's a career. We want to own yeah. the place, right? Yep. Great seat at the table. Yeah, so are there anything. opportunities in your field and... Um, I know we don't have, you know, we have a few minutes left. Does SCAD assist you with that? And then I'm gonna add a little thing on the end and you can, you can, whatever time you wanna spend on, you know, on each part, you can. With what Maureen said, do you think people your age, the youth your age, do, do y'all realize that? So I know that's a two part question. Tell me so, what, you can start yeah, with Yeah, I wanted three. to actually piggyback off of what Maureen said because yeah. honestly that question was brought up during last quarter. So I had a class called animation history. And so we had one particular class we were discussing representation within animation because that's just, it's something that feels like a fresh topic, but isn't because it's been around for so long and the discussion has been around for decades on end. Um, and so when we were asked the question, do, should we rely on these studios to give forth that representation? And I sat there kind of thinking about it because at first I'm like, well, if they're in charge of producing the media that we all come to love, especially with studios like Disney and DreamWorks where they have such a high stakes in terms of what gets put out, what gets nominated, what gets most of that recognition for animation. Should we put that in the hands of them to kind of feed into what we want to see for our own people? But then I started to kind of realize studios like that, now they're starting to kind of dip into being more diverse, but at the same time, they're not cultivating it in a way where it's both healthy for people of color, especially black people to have that environment where they feel safe to work in, where they feel like their voices are being listened to. That's still an issue that even in this present day tends to kind of go unknown unless someone speaks out about it. So I answered the question I said to myself that while yes, it is important to see that representation built by these studios, but at the same time, you have so many creative black people who want to be head of staff, who want to write, who want to direct, who want to produce, that aren't getting the same amount of attention as these old white men who have been at these studios for decades on end, who've been kind of at the helm of these studios, just dipping their toes into what they assume is diverse, what they assume are representation that people want to see. We should start administering more support, especially as Black people ourselves. I feel like it's important for us to support those smaller creatives who haven't been given that chance and given that opportunity to pay forth and help them produce these works. Like, I think just being able to see Matthew Cherry be able to be nominated and win an Oscar for Hair Love was powerful enough that so many Black creatives decided, I want to do what he did. I want to kickstart that project and make my own story inspired by my own people. And in order for that stuff to flourish, we need to be a supportive unit for those creatives. Art is just as important as any other career. I don't care what no one says. Sure, getting a doctor as a lawyer, as someone in a more advanced field for what society perceives to be advanced is important, but artists are just as influential. They make 
stuff that we feed into every day. We consume art on a daily basis. And even more so for people who are struggling to see themselves through the media that they watch. So why not foster that? Why not kickstart those projects ourselves and put forth that effort instead of waiting for a bunch of white men to make that decision for us? That doesn't have to be the thing we have to do nowadays. And especially now, since we have social media, since we're all more connected now, there's way more ways to advance that and to actually see ourselves. Um, even if it's not even on a, on a big screen, if it's not by Marvel, if it's not by Disney, that doesn't matter because any representation from our own people is better than representation from someone who barely did the research, who barely put in the time, who has this surface level understanding of what we want to see in ourselves. Like, it's just, that's just what it is. And I really hope that as time goes on, we get to see more people like Maureen said, black creatives up on the stage in these award shows, not just like a handful of people or smaller awards that are given to them, but bigger. You want to see more of those people like us at the helm, especially in creativity. I think that's very important and to showcase that for the youth too. So yeah. awesome, completely, completely agree. Ladies, e extraordinary. I mean, really extraordinary. I'm like, you know, time, look, time is going by. We're like, oh God, it's 520 now. We have more, yeah. we want to talk more. People are putting in the chat. We, we got more stuff to talk about. We have to continue this another yeah. time. I'm like, it, it was extraordinary. Let me ask you, so we do have, you know, 60 seconds left. And, and, and give me your 30 second answer in light of the pandemic. And it's a tough time for everybody. We you know, understand that they say art can help alleviate stress and just the different mental health issues, a number of things. Give me a 30 second, do you agree with that? And how do you use your art, your craft at all, any medium, any way to help you cope with stress and just in this tough time? Give me a 30 second, I'll start with Maureen and then Deja. Um, I would say, First of all, I want to clarify something. All those people and all those awards shows campaign for those awards. They campaign for those awards from the Tonys to the Emmys to the Oscars. And let me be clear, it's about getting that award. So now you get a bigger bag. Now you get a big, you go to another level. Now, art for me is my way. Ooh. Art is my way in, art is my way out. I can just sit and write. I can sit and create. I can go to the fabric store. Like right now, I'm, I'm doing this piece. I'm creating this piece entitled Some Black Beauty. And it is visual, dance, and it is spoken word. And I started off with just a motif, a tableau, a silhouette of a black woman's body, her decollete, and just sitting on a black box. I started there. So now I gotta sit and I gotta write. What visuals do I want? What do I want the music? So now I'm listening to music, hours and hours of listening, because right now I don't have the budget to commission music, but maybe soon. So to answer your question, art is, it's, it's my vibe. It's everything. It's, it's like when Mr. Ailey talked about seeing his mother walk up from the hill going to church, that was his inspiration for Revelation. Back in Rogers, Texas, it is a vibe. It comes to you and you have to cease it and you have to write it or Deja, you have to sketch it. Like I went down and I just bought fabric because I know what my dance has to do. So that's what art does. It's, it's life. It keeps you moving. It keeps you growing. It keeps you hoping. It keeps you reaching beyond the break. That's what art does. It gives you something to say always. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Appreciate that, so powerful. Deja, and we're, we're a couple minutes behind to our audience. We think if you're able to hold on for a minute, we are gonna wrap up. Deja, do you agree with art? How do you use it to cope just in this time? You agree with um, art? I'll keep mine very brief, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> so basically, 
I'm with the way I am scheduled for my classes and whatnot. I'm drawing a whole lot, like a bunch of different stuff at the same time. In fact, I think this week was a particular time where I had to crunch in on doing board revisions since I do storyboarding. So um, this entire week has just been nonstop feedback, do more sketches, get some more feedback, do more sketches, run that by with a bunch of other people within your crew, then do a couple more sketches. That's kind of just what I'd be doing pretty much all the time. But there are a handful of times where I get to just sit down and just draw whatever comes to mind, like Maureen said, get in a quick sketch, let my mind start giving off some ideas of its own and like kind of feed into the universe a bit. And yeah. when I just do that free flow, that's the part of the day where my brain starts to relax. Most of that stress that I was thinking about earlier, all this crazy scheduling stuff and making sure certain things are turned in on time and that someone receives this from one of these files. It's the moment where I get to sit down and especially for me, I have the roots of a traditional artist. So as of now, I'm trying to learn how to work in digital art because that's kind of something I need to foster for the industry. But my roots are very much embedded on pencil and paper, purely that. Um, and so sometimes what I'll do is I'll do a sketch, a quick one and kind of leave it at that. But I'll grab a pencil and I'll literally for like a couple of hours tediously shade in something just because oh. that lets my mind like get a moment to just not worry about oh, is this line perfect? Is this level of value underneath this shadow like the best it can be? Like, no, it's just, I let the pencil in my hands do the moving and whatever comes from it is, that's what it is. And it's in the universe and it's my thing and no one else has to see it. That's the best part of it too. It's just, I don't have to post on social media yeah. and like have the world kind of give their feedback. It's just something I yes. do for me, myself and alone. And I think that's definitely a beauty in using art as a way to kind of cope, especially nowadays where there's so much, a constant feed of information, a constant feed of news. And a lot of that can be negative and it can put a big damper um, on your self-worth and kind of where you are in the world. But for you to just kind of be in your own space and be in your own mind for a bit without thinking of those thoughts and just be present and do what you can do within a given moment. Um, it's, it's something that I would never like, I'm glad that art is still a vessel for that for me. It's not like, oh, I work hours on end drawing every day and now I, I hate art, I hate drawing. It's <laughs> moments like that where I'm reminded like art. Oh, oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's storming here. So that's why the lights kind of just suddenly flickered. But I'll, <laughs> I'll conclude that basically, sure okay. <laughs> sure basically okay. art is that nice vessel for that. And it can definitely be used to cope in many ways, especially if you're just someone who wants to get into it for the hobby and for just the therapeutic qualities I can bring. It's very valuable in that way. Wow. Awesome, <laughs> That's awesome. amazing. That's amazing. That's amazing. And listen, we are, we are just grateful. We're thankful for, for, you know, the both of you, uh, you know, for, you know, not that we forgot, but just, you know, we are, we work at nine to five or at seven to three or a nine to eight, nine to nine, sometimes I'm 12 hours in and, you know, forgetting that the creatives such as yourselves, you know, you're a little bit more fluid. And I, what I should have done was, I think we probably should have allocated two hours to this segment, but um, <laughs> respecting everyone's time, we, we just didn't do that. And we'll, maybe we'll have a part two to this, but we'd like to thank you all so very much for sharing your story. Uh, giving us a peek inside of who you are. You're just so wonderful. Both Maureen, Deja, Dominique, we salute Thank you. you. Thank we you. celebrate you. We're so grateful for you sharing your stories of success. We're just enamored by your beauty, your grace, your class, your style, your realness. We're we like our vibe. We like what we do. We love, we it. love the energy. Yes. Thank we you. Love it. And we thank you. And we appreciate you for taking the time out of your day spending time with us we want we to love y'all we love yes. you we want to say peace we love you love you love you thank you to our audience respecting your time we'll bid yes we'll thank bid you. you do and yes. we are just very very grateful yeah. i'm going to turn it over There's to one you. thing with this i just want to remind you those that are new or not follow us we're on instagram facebook at peace p-e-2-a-c follow us there and remember it's first fridays unless we have to make a change we're not perfect, so we get to do what we want to do, right? Because you in charge, you the boss. Exactly. You're in charge. You That's your you. rules. To Join make. us May seventh, Friday, May seventh. This is a tentative date we're we're looking at, and we're looking at entrepreneurs, so other mm -hmm. CEOs that have started their 
of business. So join us then. Yes. Mm -hmm. We'll see thank you again we'll for having us. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you so much. <laughs> Panelists, if you can stay back for just a minute, everyone else, thank you so very much for your time. Peace and many blessings to all. Thank you and so if you much. Ever, if you were members of Freedom Theater, I know we have some Freedom Theater alumni on it. Put that in the chat. I, I know Wanda's <laughs> here. I know Maureen said she is. We might have some other Philly folks that made their way and touched a bit or any acting school. Put that in the chat for us. Put that in Maybe the chat. We'll you can unmute yourselves now and say a little shout out if you'd like. Yeah. <laughs> we thank you. We thank you. We can connect you all. Yes. Yes, Great absolutely. Job. Great Free job. Theater in the house. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Awesome job, Great ladies. Job. So really inspiring. Many blessings. Thank you. A lot of energy. Really great. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Be safe. <laughs> Thank Have you. Wear your and wash your hands. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. Peace and all great things. Great job, Deja. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you all did a wonderful job, each of you. It was wonderful. Great job. Yes, you all did. Yes, you did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Awesome job, please. Amazing. Oh, I'm right just checking out, but it was. <laughs> sure really nice. Also, my son is an alumni yeah. of the Freedom Theater. Yeah, oh, yeah. Theater. Yeah. 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 Cool. That's mom Virgil <laughs> talking. That's Alexis's mom, her brother. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Awesome, awesome. Thank you guys for joining us. Yeah. Wonderful. My pleasure. Have a good night. Thank you so good much. Night. See you good in May. Day. Yes. Okay, thank you. We'll see you in May. Okay. <laughs>